Welcome everyone. Um, this is the fourth of seven uh, train station talks. This one is about wildflowers in the Sourlands. My name is Alexandra Radville. I'm a volunteer with the Sol uh, Sourland Conservancy. And I'd like to welcome you tonight to this presentation by Betty Horn. Um, first, there's just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. There are a lot of people on this Zoom call. Um, Maya, who's on our technical staff, will mute the audio from all participants. And that will just to keep it quiet so we can hear Betty's um, talk. At any time, you can have your video on or off. That's up to you. Um, on our screen, there will also be tonight um, our executive director, Lori Cleveland. And she'll probably have a few words to say after the talk is over. Betty's going to present slides um, covering various flowers. And during the presentation, we'll pause to take questions after each flower. We'll only take one or two questions focusing on the flowers and then move on to the next one. So if we don't get to your question, we'll have seen it and we'll certainly um, come to it at the end of the talk when we'll have a general question and answer uh, period. Um, if you'd like to wave a, to ask a question, as I said, tap it, type it into the um, chat section at the bottom of your screen is how you access it. And, um, or at the end of the session, we'll be able to have actual live questions. You can raise your hand and we will call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Finally, I wanna let you know that the talk is being recorded and that's so that we can offer it to other people who weren't able to attend tonight. And also you can revisit it if you would like to. And it will be on the YouTube channel for the Sourland Conservancy. And in about a week, you'll receive an email following this talk, which will give you the link to the YouTube channel. And we'll also provide the handout that uh, has the references that Betty will be talking about. Plus there'll be information about the upcoming talks um, from the train station series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Betty Horn, uh, who, wildflower enthusiast and expert. Some of you probably already know Betty, um, having made her acquaintance as I did, either in classes at the Princeton Adult School on wildflowers or by accompanying her on many, one of the many talks that walks that she's led um, in different places around the area. Um, Betty on her talks and walks guides the viewer's eye so that you will see key characteristics that can help you to identify wildflowers, not only when they're in bloom in the springtime or the summertime, but also in the winter when plant ID is a lot more tricky and depends on a much more intimate knowledge of plant details. Uh, Betty's a graduate of Radcliffe College where she studied environmental biology. She enjoys traveling to new places and learning about the local flora. Her knowledge of wildflowers encompasses the wildflowers of New England, Washington State, the Galapagos, England, and Nepal, as well as those in our backyard here in New Jersey. I'd like to now turn over the mic to Betty to tell you about the wildflowers. Betty? Thank you, Alexandra. Welcome to everybody. Uh, for each of the flowers that I'm going to show you, I will tell you the common name, the Latin name, and the family to which it belongs. You ask, why isn't common name enough? There are several reasons for that. Common names can refer to different plants in different areas, and they can also be given to the same plant in the same area. So in order to know specifically which plant you're talking about, we need those Latin names. And why are they in Latin? Latin has always been the closest to a universal language ever since classical times. All educated people knew it. Before 1735, a plant was referred to by botanists by a long Latin sentence, which described a plant quite completely, but did not indicate what relationship that plant had with other plants. So how and when did this change? In 1735, Carl von Linné, a Swedish botanist who renamed himself Linnaeus, you probably heard that name, published Systema Naturae, a classification system for the entire natural world, both animals and plants. For the flowering plants, this came down to division, class, subclass, order, family, genus, and species, all in Latin, of course, and was based on the number of sexual parts the stamens and pistils. 
But since this whole classification was too much like the lengthy Latin sentence of years before, Linnaeus suggested that a plant be referred to by just genus and species, which is what we use today. Genus would place the plant in a group of similar plants and species would describe some way in which a particular plant was unique within that genus. That's our Latin binomials. Ah, but using sexual parts for a classical classification system was scandalous in that day. And there were many botanists who disagreed with this whole theory. Linnaeus, who was still naming new plants after the publication of Systema Naturae, retaliated to his critics by giving their names to noxious weeds and rewarding his supporters by giving their names to pretty flowers. For example, Stigisbeckia orientalis is a nasty little weed called common St. Jo Paul's wort and Rudbeckia hirta is the black-eyed Susan. So it paid to be on Linnaeus's good side. Now going further into the modern times, Linnaeus himself said that classification using sexual parts was not the complete answer. There were lots of problems that this produced and that someday scientists would find new ways. And this is happening now using biochemical techniques. But basically the whole order, the classification system came from Linnaeus. The goal of plant taxonomy is the construction of a phylogenetic classification scheme, which shows how each plant is related to every other plant. And we're still working on it. Those of you who have been looking at some of the older flower guides like Newcomb's and uh, Peterson's and Audubon may find some of the names, both common and Latin names that I use are different. So this is a result of what is going on in the taxonomy right now. So let's look at flowers. First picture, please. Aha, this is our earliest blooming native wildflower. This is skunk cabbage, Simplocarpus fetitus in the arum family. And at this point you're asking, well, where is the flower? What basically we have here is something that looks like a hoodie with a ball in the bottom. Aaron family plants do things differently. Instead of using petals as the advertisement for pollinating insects, we have the hoodie, which is called a spathe. It's usually a bright color, usually this lovely deep burgundy color, and it's spotted with various amounts of green. This is the part that attracts the pollinating insects. Inside is a device, the little ball in there called a spadix, and it is covered with many little tiny flowers that are basically reduced to simply the stamens and pistils. In this species, the plant matures the female parts first. And when those have hopefully been pollinated or after a span of a couple of days, the male parts come out. The anthers bear a great deal of pollen. This plant usually blooms by the middle of March and it's able to flower early because of its ability to generate heat. The spadix uses energy stored in the rhizome, the underground root, and the space absorbs solar radiation. It's really quite warm inside the space because of this heat. And this isn't one of the other things that attracts the insects. Actually, at this time in early spring, there aren't a lot of insects around. Basically, the ones that we have with us all year round, the flies and the gnats, which are also feeding on carrion and roadkill all through the winter. So this lovely burgundy color of the space also helps to attract them. What's that green spike sitting beside it? Next picture, please. Where does the energy that the spadix uses to grow come from? This is the cabbage part of skunk cabbage. These great leaves start to unfurl as soon as the flower begins to wither. And they remain open like this, sometimes into early summer. Even when the leaf canopy has come out, they gather photosynthetic energy and store it in the rhizome so that the skunk cabbage will be able to grow quickly the next year. The fruit of this plant is a very small berry and it doesn't go very far from the parent plant, which is probably a good idea because skunk cabbage has a very specific habitat necessity. 
It needs to be in a place where there is slowly moving water, especially during the time when it's flowering. So you will find it on the banks of streams and on some of these little ephemeral streams that occur when snow melts and the ground begins to warm up after the long winter. Skunk cabbage leaves you would think would make a tasty treat for the deer and other animals, but they don't. They contain calcium oxalate crystals, which cause a burning sensation in the mouth of the eater. So they're pretty well protected like many plants. Next flower, please, unless there is a question. I have to remember to stop for that. Okay, let's go onward then. This is the round-lobed hepatica. Now the common, the common name has stayed pretty much the same through the years, but the Latin name keeps changing. Right now, there is a debate between whether it should be called Hepatica nobilis variety obtusa or anemone americana. Linnaeus, in 1753 named it anemic hepatica. So there's your choices of all of the possibilities. And botanists, this is a problem that they really love to get into, are still debating and probably there'll be another change coming up soon. This is not a true ephemeral. You see that bright green leaf there in the bottom of the picture? Their leaves are evergreen. This is one that is this year's flower. It will remain through the summer sometimes turning into a lovely burgundy color, nice red, uh, rich red, and they last through the winter and die away only in the spring when the new flower begins to bloom. Another common name for this plant is liver leaf. Supposedly, this leaf is the shape of the human liver. I cannot attest to that, but that's what I'm told. And there is an ancient theory called the doctrine of signatures that held that if any part of a plant resembled any part of the human body, then probably it could be used to treat ailments of that body part. It was a part of many liver tonics in the uh, turn of the century, 1900s or so. In fact, I read somewhere that in 1883, 425,000 pounds of hepaticas were harvested. Now they didn't say whether it was leaves or the whole plant, but either way, that's an incredible amount of plant material. It was all ground up and put into these tonics. And as you can probably guess, none of them really worked. If you will turn to the next picture, please. Like other buttercup family members, it has no petals. Well, what are those pretty colored things? Those are sepals. In other plant families, the sepals are the little green parts that shelter the developing bud. And then the, flower, the petals appear, which are the advertisement for the pollinating insect and so forth. But since all of these various flower parts, the bracts, the sepals, the petals, the stamens, and the pistils are all modified leaves during the course of plant evolution, well, it just tells you there are many ways to skin a cat or design a flower, shall we say. In the uh, hepaticas, the number of sepals are variable, usually from five to seven or eight. Another fun thing about this plant is it produces seeds and the seeds have a little food body attached to them called an eliosome. And this is very attractive to ants. The ants pick up the seeds that are dropped and as they go off, they're munching on the eliosome. And as soon as this food bit is finished, they drop the seed and there the seed gets a new place to grow. If you've ever seen a trail of violets coming out of your garden from a garden plant and traipsing across the lawn, this is done by ants carrying the eliosomes and the seeds and planting the violets out into your lawn. Next plant, please. Ah, these are spring beauties. Claytonia virginica. They're in the purslane family. This is probably our most numerous and longest lasting spring ephemeral. You may think that each flower lasts a long time, but that's not so. There are successive flowers on the stalk. And this is a way that plants, many species of plants have to in effect train the pollinating insect 
to come back again and again to the same location where they will always find a flower with nectar or pollen or both. They also have an eliosome. These produce pods, which produce, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, explode and they can scatter seeds up to two feet. So in this way, along with the ants, they're able to form large colonies. They have slender stems, but they are amazingly strong. The stems prevent ants from crawling up and getting the pollen that way. And they can also withstand very high winds. These flowers close if there is no sun and that prevents rain from washing away nectar or pollen or just because most colonating insects aren't flying around on cloudy days. The next picture, please. You probably noticed if you take walks in the woods that spring beauties come in a variety of colors. The amount of this color is due to red pigment, which interacts with two chemicals and produces a wide range of shades. But all of them, no matter whether they're mostly white or dark pink, have these red lines. These are bee guides or insect guides. They help the insect that is going to be pollinating to land in the right place and get right down to business. White petals are the shiny as well. And I might just say here that although we can see these bee guides, insects can see wavelengths of light that we're not aware of. So many flowers, which to us look plain, actually have bee guides as well. So people ask, is there any difference between these color shades? Um, is one color better than another? Uh, it's possible that pollinators are more attracted to the darker colors. It's not been proved that that's so, but what has been shown is that deeply pink flowers are more attractive to slugs and the white variety can be attacked by a fungus. So depending upon what's happening in a given area, there may be more of one color than the other. Most of our spring beauties are of the white variety, but there are lots of pretty pink ones as well. The leaves are interesting too. If you look at them closely, you'll find they have a waxy surface and they can also change their orientation so that they always face the sun and gather lots of energy in the sunlight. They're pollinated by small local bees. The next flower, ah, trout lilies. These are out in abundance right now. This is Erythronium americanum and they are in the lily family. This is a plant that has lots of common names, mostly due to the leaf design, shall we say. All of this speckling reminds people of the skin of a trout or snake skins, adder's tongue lily is another name, fawn lily for the spotting as well. And a completely erroneous name to my thinking is dog tooth violet. Obviously it's not a violet, and the dog tooth refers to the underground corm, which has little tooth-like projections, which nobody can see anyway. So anyway, strange name for that. In this case, in the lily family, a lot of times the sepals and petals are the same color. And so the botanists have decided that there's a different term for that and they are called tepals. Here, uh, you probably noticed if you go out into the woods that the outer layer of tepals, the three outer petal ones, have a brown stripe on them. So perhaps they are not identical to petals. But anyway, this is what botanists do. Once again, the flowers close at night or on rainy days for the same reason to protect the pollen and the nectar that they have. And if you've looked closely, you may have noticed that they have some flowers have red pollen and some have yellow pollen. And the question is, is there some kind of advantage to one color or the other? And there are some experiments going on right now that are hoping to find out whether there is or not. You've probably seen the incredibly large patches of single trout lily leaves that cover large areas. Most of them will probably not produce a flower. It takes a plant with two leaves to make a flower more energy is required. The seeds of this plant will eventually produce a bulblet, which is a little bulb, of course, and this will send up a single leaf the first year. 
Then during the next spring, it produces a little rootlet thing called a stolon, which travels a little ways away from the original bulblet and then produces another bulblet. So that's one way of reproducing. The mature bulbs, which takes anywhere from four to seven years to do so, also divide themselves. They produce offsets like tulips do. So when you see a patch of these trout lily leaves, they are genetically the same, but they are not connected by underground roots. These colonies last for years. Some can be hundreds of years old, and they do help to stabilize the soil, especially when they're growing in some of these damp areas. Next picture, please. Occasionally, you will find a white trout lily. This is actually a totally different species. Uh, it has turned up at Bowman's Hill now and again. Over the last 10 years, I've probably seen it three times. And this is a separate species called Erythronium albedum. So I'm not sure that it does occur in our wilds or whether this is something that Bowman's Hill has found somewhere else. Next picture, please. These are rue anemones. These are blooming in great abundance right now. The Latin name is Thalictrum thalictroides, and this too is in the buttercup family. So what you're seeing here are sepals instead of petals. So why isn't this called anemone thalictroides? Well, because it doesn't really behave the way the other anemones do. It's basically a single fragile looking stem. It has a long lasting central flower. It has leaves underneath the flower that are round lobed and smooth rather than finely divided the way other anemones are. <clears throat> and the central flower is followed by axillary flowers, which appear after the central flower has been pollinated. Now, Thalictrum is the genus name for the summer blooming rue, meadow rue, which is also a buttercup, but that flower looks nothing like this. So I'm not sure that I like this name change. They used, this genus of this used to be called Anemonella, which at least lets you know that it is an, an anemone. <laughs> Sorry about that. So let's go to the next flower. I'm sorry, it's very small, but you can see that this one is definitely pink. The, petal, the sepals are definitely pink and so are the leaves beneath the flower. The number of sepals is often variable and a fun thing to do when in a, a patch of rue anemones is to just find the one with the most sepals. Basically they're between five and 10, but I've counted one with 11, so this is fun. Next picture. And this is the rue anemone in its glory. The big flower in the center was the original one and all of the others around it are coming from the same plant and are the axillary flowers. And like the spring beauty, having a cluster of flowers like this is a, once again, the way of training the insect to come to the same place where there'll always be food. Like many also, like many of our spring plants. This had medicinal uses for many ailments by both the early colonists and the Native Americans. In fact, probably every one of our native flowers has been used medicinally at one time or another. And there are guidebooks that will tell you exactly how they were used. Peterson's has a guide to medicinal plants. Next picture, please. This is another anemone. This is the wood anemone, a much shyer little flower. You can see it just starting to bloom. These outer sepal is covered with this lovely purple blush. And you guess you can't quite see the leaves in this picture, but this has very finely divided leaves instead of the rounded ones that rue anemones do. In fact, you're most likely to see a whole patch of these leaves because the flowers don't seem to be quite as numerous as you might expect. Next picture, please. So here are they are in full bloom and you can see the leaves. Quin did I tell you the, the name of it? Anemone quinquefolia, I keep forgetting to do that. 
This too is a buttercup. And quinquefolia refers to the five divisions of the leaflets there. These flowers do not last very long, but the patches of leaves will. Next flower, please. And bloodroots. These are out right now as well. This is Sanguinaria canadense, and this is in the poppy family. The name comes from the amounts of orange sap, which are in the stem and the root. And I, looking out these days, these, since these love to, blue, to grow on sunny slopes, they often come out before even the rue anemones do. And there are lots of them in bloom right now. These look like fairly substantial flowers, but in fact, they are not. Unlike the anemones, which are known as windflowers, these are, can be damaged by winds. Even, even a hard rain will knock some of these petals off. The flower, when it comes up through this leaf litter, is wrapped up in the leaf and it makes an actual spear. So sometimes you will see these flowers ringed with dead leaves where they've come up through a hole in the leaf. The leaf, as perhaps I hope you can see there, is very distinctive and it lasts for a long time. The Native Americans use this for dye and a medicine to treat bronchitis and asthma. It also contains a substance called sanguinarine, which is actually used in some of these naturalistic toothpastes and mouthwashes, and it's said to remove plaque. Once again, these seeds of this plant have eliosomes and they are carried off by ants. Next picture. This is a favorite flower of mine that many people just overlook because this is all you really can see. It's very small. It grows maybe four inches tall at the most. It has these pale lavender flowers that never really quite open very wide. This is pennywort, Obelaria virginica in the gentian family. Most gentians are fall blooming flowers, but this one blooms in the spring. Both pennywort and obelaria seem to refer to the pairs of leaves, which are supposed to resemble coins. I don't quite see that, but somebody did. When I first came to Princeton years ago, this was quite rare, but it is spreading very nicely. And now I'm finding it in more and more places. Next picture. This is about as tall as it will get, and the flowers are completely open as far as they will go. And studies have found that this plant has a, what they call a coralloid root, one that looks like branching coral. And these roots associate with mycorrhizal fungi. So this plant does get some nutrients that way. So you can call it partially parasitic or a symbiotic relationship. So I hope people will start looking for this plant. It's one of my favorites. Thank you. This is cut-leaved toothwort, cardamine concatenata. It is a mustard. There are many mustards that are early spring plants, but most of them have such tiny flowers that they go pretty much unnoticed until they have gone by and they start producing these incredible seed pods. All the mustards have wonderful seed pods. Some of them are long and straight. Some of them are heart-shaped. Some of them look like little peas. Some of them are flat. There's even one called shepherd's purse. But this one has long, narrow pods. The name toothwort refers to tooth-like project projections on the underground stem. In fact, this has had a genus name change. It used to be formerly dentaria, which referred to this tooth-like structure. The flowers hang open downward like this in cloudy weather or in the rain to project the nectar and the pollen. But even when they're in this position, there are bumblebees that can hang upside down and stick their tongues up inside to get the pollen. But when the sun is out like it is today, these flowers turn upward toward the sun and present a lovely flat open surface for the pollinating insects. When the seed ponds are mature, they turn brown and they actually twist and when they open, they scatter the seeds a little farther away from the parent plant. 
Next picture. These are Dutchman's Bridges, Dicentra cucularia, and they are also in the poppy family. The Victorians found this common name rather rude. It was like talking about clothing that covered that part of the body was not the stuff of garden club meetings. But nonetheless, that's its name. Most likely you're liable to see these distinctive leaves and large patches on sunny hillsides perhaps one or two flower stalks coming out. They are, I think, growing from the same root system. These actually have four petals, although it's hard to see. The what obvious ones on the outside, the white ones with the yellow tips, are, are actually two petals. And then there are two more inside. Now the shape has decided advantages. The pollen and the nectar are protected from rain, but on the other hand, insects have learned to crawl up the stem and bite a hole to get at the nectar, which they get a free lunch without pollinating. Most of the pollination is done by queen bumblebees, which have a very long tongue, which they can stick up inside. It, like many of the poppy family, they have alkaloids, one of which has been known to cause a disease called stagger in cattle, but it was also once to use used to treat skin lesions and syphilis. Okay, saxifrage, early saxifrage, saxifraga virginiensis, or perhaps micranthes virginiensis in the saxifrage family. And one of these other strange name changes that I'm not really quite sure why has happened. It may be due to all of the new DNA research that says that this really isn't in the same saxifrage genus as others, and so they've changed it, but I'm not sure why. If you look at the stems, you can see that they have covered with hairs, and this is one thing that can prevent crawling insects from getting up the stem and stealing the nectar. It also helps as insulation because some of these early saxifrages do start blooming when it's still quite cold. So they kind of like a little fur coat for the stems. The flowers are quite tiny. They're only a quarter of an inch in diameter, but there are many of them. And so they attract insects by forming a crowd. The, stem, the flowers start blooming almost as soon as the stem starts growing. And so the stem elongates during the growing season, changing the appearance of the plant quite a bit. The name saxifrage means rock breaker because of the habit of this flower to grow in cracks and rocks, almost as if they were breaking the rocks. It's actually perennial because the leaves last through the winter. They often turn red. Like many of our spring flowers, it's dependent on the length of daylight to start blooming. Usually about 12 hours at spring equinox is one of the the clues that they use, but the ambient temperature can also modify the timing. Our latest winter with all of the cold weather and the lingering snow, you might have thought would keep flowers from blooming at their appropriate times, but then this great stretch of warm weather and bright sun has brought things back to just about where they usually are in an average winter. Next picture. Now I find this plant exotic looking. If you look carefully, you can see this is called heartleaf ground cell, formerly known as golden ragwort. This is Pacara aurea, formerly known as Senecio aurea, and this is in the composite family. If you'll notice the basal leaves are one shape. They are rather elongated, and at the tip of the leaf, there is what they think is a heart shape. I don't quite see that myself. The leaves on the stem are totally different. They're all finely divided. And at the top of the stalk is this purple bunch that looks like it might explode into something really quite exotic. The new genus name, Pacara, comes from a 20th century botanist. Now, this is one of these name changes that I really don't agree with. I'll get to that in a minute. Show the next picture, please. This is the flower. 
And I think that ragwort is an excellent name. Rag, wart. Wart is an old English name for plant. And it looks a bit ragged because there aren't enough ray flowers to completely make the circle. What am I talking about, ray flowers? Composites are a very different family as well. They have a totally different strategy from what we've been talking about. What look like petals surrounding a disc are actually ray flowers. In each one of those petal-like structures, there are five petals stuck together. And where they attach to the central disc, there is a stamen and pistil, which are sterile. The center of this flower head is composed of many very small disc flowers, five petal flowers in a regular formation. They mature from the outside of this disc to the inside. And once again, training the insects that come so that they will always find mature flowers. <clears throat> this is an excellent strategy here. So what about this name change? Ground cells, which all of the uh, <clears throat> ragworts have now been renamed to, are actually composites that have only disc flowers. And they have elongated disc flowers producing a very shaggy looking flower head. I'm not sure why that they've made that name change. I'm sorry about that phone call. Senecio bring to mind the common or vulgar Senecio, Senecio vulgaris, which is a very straggly, unpleasant looking plant. And perhaps if you read literature, you know about the great giant ground cells in the mountains of Africa, which are also in the Senecios. But I don't know. If it were up to me, I would still call all of these ragworts and leave the ground cell name to the true Senecios. But anyway, we can talk about that some other time. Next picture. This is a plant with two common names, depending on which flower guide you are interested in. This is Salandine poppy or wood poppy, Styloforum diphyllum. Yes, another poppy. This is becoming more and more common now. It's a beautiful plant, I think. Those leaves are really quite striking. It produces gorgeous, big, hairy seed capsules full of seeds. They drop <clears throat> sorry, from the plant in May and need the cold of winter in order to germinate. This plant is pollinated by small bees. Now, like most poppies, it does contain alkaloids. Berberine and once again sanguinarine, like the Dutchman's breeches, what has its uses in toothpaste. So this plant often tends to migrate. Uh, it likes to grow on hillsides and it will start, you'll see a plant at the top of the hill and the next year there'll be some more plants but lower down and perhaps the one at the top of the hill is no longer there. So they kind of migrate and wander around. It's kind of fun to see where they will, where they will turn up next. Next picture. Ah, this is toad trillium, trillium cecile in the bunch flower family. <clears throat> and I have this picture in because I wanted to ask you in the audience whether you have seen this plant in the Sourlands. This plant and all of the other lovely trillium that exist and also the uh, beautiful yellow lady slipper are plants that I have seen at Bowman's Hill and I'm sure they have been planted there. And I know there are similar habitats in the Sourlands where I would hope they would exist. So perhaps if any of you know about them, you can let me know. The name of course comes from the mottled leaves that are supposed to look like the skin of a toad. I've always thought that they make toad umbrellas. You could see the little amphibian sitting there during a rainstorm in there. These flowers never open wide like the other trillium do. So the insect has to force its way in between the petals. It spreads by underground rhizomes and does not transplant very well. So I wonder if it's out there somewhere. Next picture. Ah, the plant that everyone loves to hate. This is Lesser Salandine, Ranunculus vicaria, in the buttercup family. 
When I first came to Princeton, I won't say how long ago, this was quite scarce. It grew in only one spot that I knew of. And of course now it is absolutely everywhere. How does it do that? Well, there are two variants, two subspecies. One, Ficaria, reproduces by seeds, but the other, the Bulbifer, reproduces by tubercles, which are little nodules which grow on the stem of the plant. And when the plant is finished blooming and the stems lie down on the ground, the tubercle detaches and washed by rainwater or other means, goes a little further to set up new plants. I think it's also carried on our shoes as we walk through areas where this plant is available and gets deposited with the dirt on our shoes and other places. I'm sure that's how it came to my front yard. Uh, like many buttercups, it has the shiny petals. This is due to oil cells on the surface layer, which underlay cells with <clears throat> there. Now, the oil cells are on the surface and underneath that there are other cells containing starch to support them. Unfortunately, the leaves are not eaten by anything because they contain a substance called protoanemarin. The roots contain saponins, which are vasoconstrictors. They can reduce redness and have been used to treat hemorrhoids. This plant is native to Eurasia, also to England, and was in inspiration for the poet Wordsworth. This is the guy who wrote the I wandered lonely as a cloud, and was in rhapsodies about the hosts of golden daffodils. Well, daffodils aside, Wordsworth wrote not one, but two poems dedicated only to Lesser Salendine. It does show that he was very observant, noting that they close at night. And somehow he just found this plant charming. Let me quote from a couple of these poems. First one called The Lesser Salendine. It goes, there is a flower, the Lesser Salendine, that shrinks like many more from cold rain. And the first moment that the sun may shine, bright as the sun himself, is out again. And it goes on in a like vein for five more stanzas. So it does prove that he was observant, noting the habit of this closing at night. The second poem is called To the Small Salendine. And uh, somewhat like rhymed dog roll in my opinion. But anyway, the first stanza goes, pansies, lilies, king cups, daisies, let them live upon their praises. Long as there's a sun that sets, primroses will have their glory. Long as there are violets, they will have a place in story. There's a flower that shall be mine, tis the little salandine. And there are more, seven more stanzas for this. And it concludes, prophet of delight and mirth, ill requited upon earth. So perhaps people in England weren't quite as enamored of this plant as Wordsworth was. Okay, next flower. Ah, this is our native columbine, Aquilegia canadense. This also is in the buttercup family. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't look anything at all like a buttercup but apparently it is. Linnaeus gave it the name Aquilegia because supposedly the spurs of the columbine resemble the talons of an eagle. This is a plant that likes rocky cliffs and drier areas. Most of our other spring ephemerals that I've been talking about prefer sunny slopes that face south and west with some good moisture in early spring. Hummingbirds are attracted to this color and often attempt at least to get the nectar from it with their long bills, but it's the queen bumblebee that is able to hang onto the bottom of the bell here and collect and transfer the pollen. But in all visits of pollinating insects are somewhat infrequent, so it does occasionally self-pollinate. The seeds are not spread <clears throat> by, by ants carrying eliosomes. They simply drop from the very beautiful seed pods they produce. here. Uh, next flower, please. This is our native wild geranium, geranium maculatum in the geranium family. 
Another name for this plant is crane's bill because of the form of the seed pod, which is quite long and sticks up like the bill of a crane. Geranium in Latin means crane and maculatum refers to the sometimes mottled leaves that are often with it. Mature seed pods pop open and scatter the seeds, but that's not all. These seeds have a tail on them called an awm, which twists respond in response to changes in humidity. This allows the seed to travel a little farther along the soil away from the parent plant until it finds a hole or a crack. And that point, the awm drives the seed down into the soil, planting it. In this flower, the anthers, the male part of the plant matures first, and they actually drop off before the stigma of the female part matures in order to avoid self-pollination. And it's the honeybees that pollinate here. Are they related to our familiar potted plant geraniums? No, they come from South Africa and are actually called pelargoniums. And how the name geranium got stuck on them, I do not know, maybe someone does. Next picture, please. Ah, this is our local showy orchis, Galliaris spectabilis in the orchid family. This is becoming more and more common since I have been looking in wild places. It's not a very spectacular, huge plant, it grows maybe five or six inches high, but these are quite fascinating flowers. They, <clears throat> like the other spring ephemerals, grow on slopes that are well-drained facing to the south and west where they get lots of sun. They produce copious nectar inside. And like most orchids, these are designed to be pollinated by a specific insect, which is the female bumblebee. And why her? Because she has a bare face, which she sticks into the opening in the orchid. And there she receives two sticky pollen bundles, which adhere in a position on her face that ensures that they will touch the stigma of the next flower. So orchids are fun. Next flower. This is Dame's Rocket, Hesperus matronalis. This is not a native flower. This is from Eurasia as well and has become naturalized here. Perhaps as you drive along the roads a little later in the season, probably end of April, early May, you see large patches of this flower and it comes in a range of colors from this lighter white color, next picture, to deep purple. <clears throat> it has a wonderful scent, almost like carnations, a cinnamony scent. And it's strongest in the evening. Hesperus means evening. And the term matronalis actually comes from Pliny, who claims that this was a favorite flower of Roman matrons to grow in their gardens. And like all of the mustards, it produces many, many seeds. Okay, uh, see, we're getting close to eight o'clock. I just wanna do maybe three or four more flowers if you'll stay with me. <clears throat> this is narrow-leaved blue-eyed grass, Cicerincum angustifolium, and this is an iris. It's very easy to overlook because the flowers are quite small, not even quite an inch in diameter. And this is not the usual placement for iris flowers, but it's not unusual. I have a house plant called a walking iris, which does the same thing, only that iris flower looks more like a true iris. This flower opens only in the full sun and wilts if it is picked. It occurs in clumps looking like grass in damp places. And bees and bee flies are the pollinators for this plant. Okay, next please. I think everybody knows Jack in the pulpit, Erisema trifilum in the arum family, like skunk cabbage. Only in this case, the spathe is the pulpit, that green cap that comes up and over, and Jack, or Jill as you will hear, lives inside the pulpit. It is a club-like structure with the flowers clustered at the very bottom. This is a unisex plant. 
and you can tell which plant it is without priving, prying into its privacy by the number of three lobe leaves it comes with. This is a jack. There is one three lobed leaf there. Females have two. And this plant could be a female next year if it stores enough energy in its underground root. And likewise, a female plant, if somebody steps on it or it doesn't get enough sunlight, could revert to being a male the next year. Depends on the amount of carbohydrate that gets stored. You might see in the wild that there are differences in the amount of color on the space. Some of them are bright green like this. Others are striped with a purpley color. These are simply variations. They are not different species. And like skunk cabbage, this contains calcium oxalate, so it is not eaten, or at least not a lot. Next picture is Jill in the pulpit, looking very much like Jack, only there are two three-lobe leaves. These plants are pollinated by fungus gnats, which fly inside and crawl around the flowers at the base of the spadix in there. The female produces a bunch of bright red berries in the fall, and they germinate best when they are eaten by box turtles. Now, isn't that a wonderful thought? These turtles eating the seeds and crawling off and leaving them in their trail? Who would have thought that they are a seed spreader? Some people, when seeing the leaves of the jack in the pulpit, think that they are trillium, but there is a way you can tell. Trilliums have equilateral leaves. They're equal on each side. And jack in the pulpit leaves have a flat side where they are attached to the stem. Now I do have more flowers, but I think we need to stop so that you have a chance to ask questions. So let's call it quits right here. Any questions, people? <laughs>